Yesterday was a pretty awesome day for Star Wars. We had the final Andor trailer, and while it was revealed that the show is going to be pushed back all the way to September, I don't think many Star Wars fans can deny how awesome that trailer was. But today, my dear friends, we have even more Andor news. It just doesn't stop. Let's get the ball rolling. We have so much to get through. So the primary focus of today's video is Tony Gilroy, the showrunner for the Rogue One spinoff. We begin with an exclusive from Empire Magazine. They've provided this new still with some new details and a new interview. And the big highlight, the big piece de resistance of this one is that Andor does not use the volume. It was more of a show that was filmed on location, or as Tony Gilroy says in this interview, they went old school. But don't get it wrong, that's not to say the volume wasn't used, because as pointed out by Genevieve O'Reilly, for certain battle sequences, as well as complex backgrounds and scenery, they did use the volume, but the difference is, they used it sparingly, they didn't rely on it. And now, Tony Gilroy is opening up. Let's dive into it. As the new documentary series Light and Magic makes clear, and go and see it if you've not done so, it's amazing. Star Wars has always been at the forefront of technical innovations in movie production. The effects on George Lucas's original trilogy were groundbreaking, as was the shift to digital in the prequels. It's a tradition that more recently has been continued with pioneering production techniques on The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, and Obi-Wan Kenobi series that all made use of the volume, an Ultra HD video wall that offers in-camera effects and immersive digital environments for actors to work in. Also known as Stagecraft, it's been deployed liberally on every Star Wars series so far, until now. The Andor series went predominantly practical with its environments. That meant building massive sets at Pinewood, heading out into the world to shoot on location and leaving the video wall behind altogether. Now, interestingly enough, in this interview, Tony Gilroy says, yep, we went old school. We did didn't use stagecraft at all. Tony's comments directly contradict those of Genevieve O'Reilly. They didn't rely on the volume, but they did use it, and now he's saying it wasn't used at all. Tony says his choice was to add more grit and earthiness to the series, all about capturing that texture. Remember that this series is set when the Star Wars galaxy is particularly dark, and he wanted to show that danger on screen, but the effect was the stark opposite of dark and dangerous Vandal's cast. Diego Luna says, as an actor it's beautiful, everything is mechanical, you're interacting with real stuff. And then Fiona Shaw, who plays a character called Marva in the series, also reveled in the practicality. This is what she said. My character's house is built from parts of old spaceships. I used to go out and just stare at it. Breathtaking. The only downside, shooting with expansive vistas occasionally meant some long, big walks. And Diego Luna specifically remembers a memory from Scotland. He said, in Pitslockery, Scotland, we had to walk for hours up a mountain to get one shot. Huge effort, really dangerous to get out there. All you can see around you is sky, trees, rivers, lakes, amazing. But he saw the positive by adding, it was like being on another planet. And the article finishes by saying something I've repeated time and time again on this channel. Prepare for Andor to make the Star Wars galaxy feel bigger than ever before. It's all coming together, guys. And I wonder now with the series being pushed back to September, if we will get more TV spots, more exclusive footage and interviews like this. I'm sure it's going to be worth the wait. So staying on the subject of Andor and Tony Gilroy, we've now got some new information. While we did go through all the producers, executive producers, cinematographers, actors, and directors recently, we now have a bit of a contradiction. According to Variety, Tony Gilroy directed the pilot episode of the series, along with an additional four episodes. The addition of Tony to the list of directors is certainly a surprise, given previous reports, but also that Gilroy himself previously stated that each of the announced directors handled three episodes each, with Karen believed to be directing the additional three episodes, but maybe this is a mistake on Variety's part, which Bespin Bulletin believe could be the case. But it does seem quite odd for such a reliable outlet, an outlet that is so connected to the movie studios. At this point, unless clarification comes, we're just gonna have to wait and see when the show drops. But just keep in mind that Tony Gilroy may have directed five of the 12 episodes of season one. So, one final thing for the Andor series, this awesome looking poster, very reminiscent of the original trilogy, but it's also got this gritty, rustic look to it, almost like a wanted sign, quite appropriate for Rebels on the Run. So from the top down, we obviously have Diego Luna's Cassian Andor, looking awesome, his beard is cool, his outfit is epic, and just generally, I love this guy's vibe. Then below him, we have Luthen Rael, which is Stellan Skarsgård's character, then we have Mon Mothma, Adriel Hona's character, and as we steer left, we also get some stormtroopers. So underneath Mon Mothma, we have a new character called Vel Sartha. Then next to her, we have a new Imperial. Of course, to the right, we have a younger Saw Gerrera. In the middle, below those three, we have a new female Imperial officer called Dedra Moreau. 
To the left of her, we have another new character called Clea, a contact of Luthen Rail and also a revolution sympathizer. Moving right, we have B2 Emo, the new companion droid of Cassian Andor, also known as just B. And we finish with another unnamed character, one of the characters we see earlier in the trailer on the grassy planet. So that is awesome stuff. The Rebellion begins on September the 21st. Bear in mind, there is a three episode premiere and the Bad Batch season two drops the week after. Unless of course, Disney have plans to move that as well. I would not be too surprised. And so finally, my dear friends, a quick word on canon. We've debated this issue over and over again on the channel, but now the author of the Ahsoka novel, E.K. Johnston, has spoken out about it. Now, I will say as a disclaimer, there has been an update to this. It all originated with the Tales of the Jedi plot leak circulating online, and as a result, many fans assumed that large chunks of E.K. Johnston's Ahsoka were once again being retconned. But according to a post on Twitter by Johnston herself, that's not the case at all. Not only this, but the original Twitter leaker a SoCas has clarified some of the earlier information has changed. But let's see what Johnston had to say. There isn't a big conspiracy behind the changes in Ahsoka's story. Dave approved the book six years ago and then kept working on her journey. It's frustrating to see people gleefully declare my book non-canon instead of just using their imaginations like we did. And as I clarified when I did cover these leaks, it's important for us as fans to wait until the shows come out before we judge them. And as aforementioned, a SoCas the leaker has now clarified some of those details. They do not necessarily retcon as much as we thought. And from Dave Filoni's perspective, I very much doubt he would have approved a book and and deliberately gone against it. So let's wait for Tales to drop later in the fall and then we can really judge for ourselves what's been retconned and what is simply just a different perspective, a different point of view that adds to the canvas of Ahsoka's story. So I suppose with that said, share your thoughts below guys. What do you make of all of this? Not just Tales of the Jedi but also all of the and or news we had in today's video. If you enjoyed this one my dear friends, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see you in the next one. May the force be with you always. Hey guys, it's me again. Congratulations for making it to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Your treat is a bonus video. I've done these a couple of times. I mainly do them on Patreon, but because a few of you have said you really enjoy them and you want more of this kind of candid, not edited version of myself going through some of the Rogue One visual guide, I decided why not do one that's relevant to the recent Andor trailer that we got. So the person that we see in the Andor trailer that's part of Saw's hideout, part of Saw's partisans, if you will, is two tubes, but which one? Well, there's two of them. It's not the two tubes to the left, but rather this guy on the right, Benthic. So let's see what this book has to say about them. Well, both of them, Edrio and Benthic, are both called two tubes. They were born on the planet of Yartogna, and their species is Tognath. They are affiliated with Saw Gerrera's rebel faction, and they are 1.90 meters, which is six foot three. Basically a whole foot taller than myself. They're 32 standard years old, and they're pretty terrifying. I'm just really excited we're going to see them, or at least one of them. So a fun fact about Ben Thick used to associate with Enfys Nest, and I speculated in the past that we might see Enfys in this show. That'd be amazing. There's already a lot of times to solo a Star Wars story in Rogue One. They're kind of doing like the two anthology series connections all in one show, which I think is pretty cool. We see that not only with the Death Troopers, but the Mud Troopers too. So what's there to learn about them? Well, Edrio and Benthic are mercenary Tognats who have signed up to Saw Gerrera's Rebels and operate out of Jeddah. They share the bluntly descriptive moniker of two tubes for the breathing apparatuses that allow them to operate in human standard atmospheres. The native world of Yartogna was conquered and occupied by the Empire, forcing them to flee as refugees. With a desire to strike back at the Empire, Edrio and Benthic have no reservations about Gerrera's violent methods. And that's kind of why they stuck by him. They're kind of fine with the terroristic tactics that Saw takes. There is a little tidbit here that's pretty interesting. Lost in translation. Benthic brought Imperial Defector Bodhi Rook to Saw Gerrera, as we see in Rogue One, marching him blindfolded to the catacombs from Jeddah City. The term Defector has no translation in Tognath, so it was fortunate Morif was able to convey the concept to two tubes, lest Bodhi not survive the encounter. Benthic would not ordinarily hesitate to kill an Imperial. I dare to say these two are quite simple-minded. I'm not too familiar with Tognaths or their biology or much about the species at all, but it seems as though they've got like a goal in mind and they don't have the emotional complexity of humans. I could be wrong though, if you know more about the species then let me know in the comments. But I thought they were interesting. It's exciting to see some familiar faces from Rogue One. Not just these two. But some of Saw's other partisans also appeared in the trailer. 
we saw this guy as well, the Van Tenza. So if you enjoyed these little tidbits, let me know if you want more. Once again, guys, may the force be with you always.